For tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. New Year's Eve, watch night, and communion service being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is the midwinter family camp meeting. This is the final service of the, the meetings. This is New Year's Eve, December the 31st, 1984. Norman Parrish ministering. This is one of two of the evening service. Praise you, Jesus. Brother Parrish will minister the word to us. Brother Miller informed me that tonight I would be delivering the last message of this convention. I got a little bit nervous. It's not hard, it's not easy to preach a message after the superb teaching and ministry that you've had this week. But really, uh, tonight it's a very difficult matter to bring a message that can uh, sort of wrap up everything that has happened in the last uh, week or the last ten days. And I trust that you'll be just a little patient with me. As I meditated, as I prayed, the Lord drew my attention to the book of John, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20. And we're going to read just a couple of verses. Let's start reading verse 19, and we'll uh, read down to verse 22. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent you, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. This is the message that the Lord gave, for me, for, gave me for you tonight. It's the message of, that will commission you to go out after this convention into the world to be as Jesus and to work as Jesus in 1985. See, the Lord Jesus Christ knew the certainty that he had been sent of his Father. There were no doubts, no questions in his mind. He knew that he had not come on his own. He did, had not come out of his own Volition. He had not come out of his own choice. He came because the Father sent him. He was a sent one. Uh, today he would have been called, or he would be called a missionary, or he would be called an apostle. Because he had been sent of the Father to the world to carry out a definite plan and a definite purpose. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here that in the same fashion, in the same manner that he had been sent of the Father to the world, so we have been sent into the world. He, as the Lord of the harvest, has called us and has sent us out into the world to continue the work that he carried out during the days of his flesh. There in Acts 1, chapter 1, the, the writer of this memorable book says that he was just recording the things that Christ had begun to do and to teach. The word begin makes us realize that Christ's ministry of teaching had not come to an end. Although he had been resurrected and he had been ascended to the right hand of the Father in the, the heavenly, yet he was going to continue to teach and he was going to continue to minister through his church. The church was supposed to carry on the same type of ministry that Christ had carried on during the days of his flesh. And brethren, I think to a large extent the church has missed the point. The church has failed because we've engaged in a lot of... Uh, Activity that seems good and necessary and wonderful at times. But I would like to ask you tonight, have we taught what Jesus taught? Have we done what Jesus did? Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so, in like manner, send I you. Tonight the Lord wants to commission us. And the Lord wants to send us out. You didn't, you didn't come to this convention just to have a good time. You didn't come to this convention just to get delivered or just to get inspired. 
God brought you to this place so that after three or four days or more of ministry, you can go back to your place of, of, uh, uh, of residence. You can go back to your place of work. You can go back and carry on the same commission that Jesus carried on, on during the days of his earthly life. So send I you. This is my message tonight. Uh, this is the closing message of this convention. Because God wants to send forth out of this place, as a result of this convention, men and women, young and old, that will go out to duplicate or go out to reproduce the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the world. Amen? Now, let's study some of the purposes for which Jesus came, Christ came to the world. He states them in plain words. The Gospel of St. John is a, is, a, is a gospel where you'll find that word, verb sent, 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 numerous times. Uh, I didn't add them up, but I would say that word sent can be found in the Gospel of St. John at least 50 times or more. Jesus wanted to emphasize the fact that as he had been sent by the Father into the world, he is now sending us uh, by the Spirit into the world. So let's look at some of the purposes of his coming. First of all, Jesus was sent into the world to do the Father's will. To do the Father's will. And let's look at some of the scriptures that can uh, uh, convince us of this truth. Let's go to John chapter 6, verse 38. Keep your Bibles, for the most part, open in the Gospel of St. John. John 6, 38. And let's read what he says here. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, did Jesus have a will of his own? As, uh, as a divine being and as a human being, he had a will. He had... Uh, a free will that he could bend or that he could direct in whatever way he chose to. He had the, he had a right to make his own decisions as we do. He had a right to make his own choices as we, we, we do. He had a right to make his own uh, de determinations as we do. But he said he had come down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of his Father, the will of him that sent him. And let me ask you, brethren, why are we in the world today? To do the Father's will. Uh, but sad to say, most of us have become accustomed to doing our own will. We've been deceived of the enemy into doing our own will. Uh, and we claim this right to make our own choices and make our own decisions. But really, when we have, uh, have been commissioned of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should go out with the only purpose of doing God's will at whatever cost. Uh, there are going to be uh, sacrifices to be made. We are going to have to deny ourselves. We're going to have to deny uh, some of the things that today we consider so uh, necessary and so pleasurable. But the Bible says that Jesus came to do the Father's will, and in the same manner we are sent out by Jesus Christ to do the Father's will. Let's look at another verse here in uh, the same Gospel of St. John. John 4, 34. Jesus was interviewing the Samaritan woman, the woman by the, uh, at the will. He had had a long talk with this woman. She was a libertine. She was a whore. She was a woman that had sought in, in carnal pleasure uh, the happiness that uh, had uh, avoided her for so long. But in, in the, as he was talking to this woman, he, uh, before he began to talk to this woman, he sent his disciples into town to seek for, for some food. Something to eat, something to drink, some nourishment. And uh, while they were away, he had this uh, counseling session with the Samaritan woman. When they came back, they were kind of surprised because it wasn't uh, looked on with a, a great deal of, uh, you know, it wasn't looked on with approval that Jesus should be talking in such a lonely spot with a woman, especially with a Samaritan woman. Uh, they were shocked to discover that Jesus had spent time with this woman. Uh, and so they kind of interrupted. They said, Lord, here, here, why don't you stop for a little while? And why don't you uh, take some nourishment? Why don't you eat? Why don't you drink? And what did Jesus answer to them? It's right here in verse 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. The thing that fills me, the thing that satisfies me is to do the will of him that sent me. Amen? Now let me ask you, brethren, what is the thing that will bring joy and satisfaction into our lives to do God's will. 
Uh, if we continue to do our own will, we're going to be the most miserable and the most uh, frustrated people in the world. But if we discover God's will and we make a deliberate effort to do God's will, we're going to find satisfaction just the same way that Jesus found it. No, we don't have to go very far in Scripture to find out what the will of God is for us. I'm just going to mention a few verses. Uh, there in First uh, Thessalonians, if you want to uh, look it up, if you want to read it for yourself, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. What is the will of God for us? That we be set apart, that we be cleansed, and we be sanctified. Uh, in fact, uh, the word sanctification here is related directly, directly with sexual pleasure. It says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Amen? And brethren, we, if we're going to do the will of God, we're going to have to take control of our, the sexual side of our life. And we're going to have to abstain and even flee from any carnal pleasure that is contrary to the will of God. Amen? For the will of God is your sanctification. How many are willing in 1985 to do God's will in this aspect? Uh, uh, to clean up your life, to straighten up your life, uh, to come into a new dimension of holiness that God is requiring from his people today. Amen? Now let's look at another verse right here in 1 Thessalonians. I'm just mentioning a few in passing. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What is the will of God? Not only that we be holy, but that we be grateful. Amen? In everything give thanks. Have you been able to give thanks in that adverse circumstance in which you've found yourself lately? Have you been able to give God thanks for that, uh, that job that you're having to uh, do uh, my, uh, against your own best wishes? Have you been able to give thanks for, uh, uh, to God for that husband? or for that wife. Uh, there's many things in life that we don't specially approve, but that we have to appreciate. Uh, in everything give thanks, whether it might seem good or bad, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, brethren, we're beginning to discover that if we are going to uh, carry out the divine commission, if we are going to be as Christ was, if we are going to do as Christ did, uh, we're going to have to do God's will all through the year of 1985. Amen? God's will is that we be sanctified. God's will is that we be grateful. I'm, I'm just thinking right now of that verse in Matthew chapter 7. If you can turn with me there. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Amen? What's going to ensure our entrance and our participation in the kingdom of God? How are we going to particip participate fully in the kingdom of God? Not only in the ages to come, but in the here and now. How? By doing the will of God. Now, here in these verses, it says that in that day, some will come and say, Well, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Uh, didn't we perform miracles? Didn't we cast out demons? And Jesus will say unto them, I didn't know you. Now, this would seem to imply that at times it might not be God's will for us to prophesy. And that at times it might not be God's will for us to perform miracles. At times it might not be God's will for us to cast out demons. See? Uh, we always are attracted to the supernatural. We always want to be doing something of a spectacular nature. We always want to be exercising the gifts. We always want to be uh, seeing the manifestations of the power of God in, in and around us. But you know what the Lord is trying to teach us here is that to Him it's more important that we do His will than we do His works. Amen? He's not dismissing uh, the gifts of the Spirit or the manifestations of the Spirit. Uh, God is not saying that, it, that miracles are not important or that tongues are not important. No. But there's something that God desires about everything up in our lives and is, that is that we discover His will and do His will. Amen? Are you in agreement with me? Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I know this verse lends itself to many different interpretations. I've been asked about this verse many times by people that are mm, opposed to deliverance. You'll notice there it says, In that day some will come to him and say, it's a profession, it's a pretense, they will say, I did this, I did that. And the Lord will answer, I never knew you. Uh, he's not agreeing with them. He's not 
accepting the fact that they had spoken and that they had prophesied or that they had performed miracles. No. They were just saying it, trying to impress the Lord. They thought they gained his favor by saying that they had prophesied and by saying that they had performed miracles. But I believe over and above everything else is that God wants us during the next 365 days, all through 1985, he wants us to do his will, whatever it might be, at whatever cost it might take. Amen? Now, what did it cost Jesus to do God's will? It cost his life. Uh, because in the Garden of Gethsemane, just a few hours before he was betrayed and before he was, he was judged and before he was crucified, he came face to face uh, with a crisis, the most important crisis of his life. Hmm? And you remember the struggle that went on. As, as a human being of flesh and blood, he recoiled from what lay ahead. He knew that just, just down the road he was going to have come face to face with the cross. And the cross was an awful death that was reserved for what was considered uh, hopeless cases. Criminals that could not be corrected or cannot be salvaged. And so what did Jesus say? Say, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But, and this is something we're going to have to learn to say in every unlikely situation in our life. What is it? Not by my will, but thine be done. We're going to have to lay our will down. We're going to have to uh, surrender our will to the will of God. And I would like to ask you tonight, how many of us are willing next year, beginning <laughs> at 1201, that's just a few hours away. Huh? When the new year is ushered in, how many of us are willing to begin to do God's will at any cost? Now, don't make this decision lightly or rapidly. Because we don't know what lies ahead. There might be many, many unpleasant experiences down the road. Huh? The Lord might call upon us to do things that we would just not like to do under any circumstance at all. But the Lord... But brethren, I don't think we have any choice, do we? How many of you have recognized Jesus as Savior and as Lord of your life? Huh? And if you've called Jesus Lord, Lord, you are obligated to submit to his will. To discover it and carry it out, no matter what that might entail. Amen? So the first thing Jesus was sent into the world for was to do what? To do God's will. Amen? Uh, let's look at another verse here. In John 5.30, I'm just going to give you as many as I can tonight. John 5.30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus not, had not only laid down his will, but his ability to do anything. When the Bible says that when Jesus came to earth, he emptied himself. He emptied himself of what? Of many of his divine attributes, of many of his divine prerogatives. Jesus, as God, was omnipotent. Amen? He had all power. He had all authority as God. But when he took upon himself a human body, what did he have to do? Accept the limitations of that human body. Huh? He had to accept the limitations of God. He left his, uh, uh, his set aside temporarily, involuntarily, one of his attributes. And that attribute was his omnipotence. Uh, he became limited as to what he could do. I, of myself, can do nothing. There was a total dependency upon the Father. Amen? He had to draw from the Father the strength, the power that he needed to do what he was called upon to do. Amen? And that's what God wants us to do. He wants to teach us dependency. Uh, many of us are too self-confident. Many of us are too self-assured. Many of us, uh, especially when we're young, think that we can do anything. We can turn the world upside down. We have so much talent, so much ability that we could just uh, transform our world. But sooner or later, the Lord's going to let us fall flat on our nose. Huh? He's going to let it trip us up. And we're going to make some blunders and we're going to make some mistakes and we're going to fail miserably in certain situations so that we can learn what Jesus learned. What is that? I can do of myself. All I can do is see what the Father is doing, and hear what the Father is doing, and cooperate with the Father. Amen? My Father until now worketh, and I work. That's why Jesus spent so many hours alone with the Father. 
uh, he would go out into uh, some lonely spot, spend hour after hour, some, all through all through the night at times. What was he doing there? Receiving instruction. Uh, the Lord of the Father was speaking to him. The Father was laying out his work, was outlining the work that he was supposed to carry out the next day and the following day. And brethren, that's what the Lord wants us to do. Wants to teach us dependency. Uh, we we many times rush ahead of, of God. Uh, we get an idea. And because it seems good, uh, we rush out to carry, to, to, uh, carry it out. Uh, we see someone else doing something. Uh, there's a lot of imitation in, the, in, in Christian circles. We see somebody with a successful television ministry and we decide that we're going to have one, just like that. And we get ourselves up to our necks in my place. Because we have to cajole, we have to borrow, and before we know, we're just uh, in bankruptcy, of course. Uh, because that television program might have been God's will for that man, but it had, was never God's will for us. Amen? I've been encouraged down through the years as a missionary to get involved in all kinds of activities. Brother Ben talked about the school that he had in Jamaica. I've had people come down and say, why don't you open a school? Why don't you open an orphanage? And we'll finance it. We'll get back behind your financing. I remember after the Guatemalan earthquake in 1976, uh, some uh, represented some of the big, uh, what you would call charitable organizations, Christian organizations in America that specialize on uh, benevolent activities. They came to me and said, Norman, with all your contacts, with, with all your experiences, why don't you open an orphanage? That orphanage would support your entire ministry. They said, uh, American people have a soft touch for children. American uh, people will support children where they will support nothing else. And by getting families and getting groups to sponsor children, you can support your entire outreach. It sounded very good. But you know what the Spirit of God told me to do? Say, no, nothing doing. That's not my calling. I know what God has called me to do in Latin America. He's called me to plant churches. He's called me to train pastors. He's called me uh, to extend his work, the work of the kingdom of God, throughout all the, those areas and throughout all those countries. And I'm trying to do that to the best of my ability. But I don't want to get sidetracked into something that isn't God's will for my life. Amen? A television ministry looks wonderful. Uh, an orphanage, a clinic, a school. All these things are, are, are good. They bless the humanity. But let me tell you, brethren, that's not my call. And I'd be foolish to deviate from my call. To get involved in something that is not God's revealed will for my life. And let me encourage you, brethren, to discover what God's will is for you in particular. Go into fasting. Go into prayer. Begin to seek God's faith until he reveals his will to you. And then what? Do it. Amen? Don't let anything or anybody interfere with God's will for your life. Uh, there will be other voices. They'll come and offer uh, they'll try to distract you. They'll try to deviate you from that path that God has set before you. But don't let anything or anybody interfere with what God, is God's will for your life. Amen? What is, should be the, our first purpose in 1985? To do God's will. To do the will of him that has sent us. By doing that, we are following Jesus. We are imitating Jesus, and he's the only one that's worthy of imitation. Amen? Jesus was sent to do God's will. And he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Let me ask again, how many of you are willing with God's help, with the power and the courage that we can draw from the Holy Spirit, how many of you are willing to do God's will? Huh? It's going to be costly. There's a heavy price to pay. Uh, to do it. And uh, a year from now, on this same date, you could stand up and testify to the fact that the best year of your life has been the year of 1985. Huh? Because you have done what? You have done God's will. However and wherever. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to re read verse 7, verse 9, verse 10. Then I said, or then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I come to do thy will, or God. Verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, if Christ had never done God's will, we would have never been sanctified. 
It's by his obedience to the will of God that we were saved, we were delivered, we were sanctified. All the benefits of, re of Calvary, all the benefits of his redemptive work on Calvary have come to us 2,000 years ago because Jesus back then made a decision that he never wavered from. And what was that? Lo, I come to what? To do thy will, O oh God. Let me suggest, brethren, tonight that this should be our number one purpose down to 1985. As the Father sent me, so send I you. Jesus was sent to do God's will. We have been sent in likewise to do God's will. Let's seek his will. Let's discover his will. Let's implement his will. Let's carry it out to the fullest extent. And then we can uh, have the joy and satisfaction of knowing that we're living right in the center of God's will for our life. Okay, in second place, Jesus was not only sent to do God's will, but Jesus was sent to seek God's glory. He never tried to glorify himself. He never tried to magnify himself. Uh, everything he did, he sought to glorify the Father. Amen? How many are with me tonight? Let's look here in the book of St. John. John chapter 7, verse 18. This is very plain. He, the, the scriptures say, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, or seeketh the glory of him that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now, Jesus is saying here that we have a choice. We can seek our own glory, or we can seek the glory of him that sent us. And let me tell you, brethren, there's too many self-seeking ministries already <laughs> in the Christian arena. Men that are tooting their own horn. Men that are promoting themselves. Men that are, are just talking, <laughs> uh, well... There was one man in the Bible, if you want to look in Acts chapter 8, that uh, spake of himself. And who was this man? Simon the sorcerer. Uh, when he arrived in Samaria, he had to toot his own horn. This is one of the ways you can find out false ministries, for counterfeit ministries. Acts chapter 8. Turn with me there. It says in verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving himself, giving out that himself was some great one. He, he was giving out that he was a great one. And when I see it, some of these publications that come from, uh, some of our modern day evangelists, uh, it's a little bit nauseating. Uh, sometime back, I, I got a magazine from one of these men. I don't like mentioning names, but no need to mention names. But I went through the magazine and I underlined the times that he, he mentioned the name of Jesus and the times that he mentioned the name of uh, Sonko, of himself. And his name appeared in that magazine five times to every time that the name of Jesus appeared. Five to one. In his estimation, his name was more important than the name of Jesus. Now, that's a very dangerous thing, brother, because God will have no other gods before him. And when a man idolizes himself and promotes himself, He's going to become another fixture in God's trash heap, the trash heap of history. Amen? God's going to discard him. God's going to put him on the shelf. He's going to become a castaway. Why? Because he's usurping a privilege that doesn't belong to him. I remember many years ago when we first began to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Guatemala. That was in 1963, 1964. God sent a tremendous revival that spread from our church to other churches, and spread from our country to other countries. The story was never written up, uh, and I'm glad, because there's nothing that will ruin uh, a real move of the Spirit of God as propaganda will. Uh, the, the Indonesian revival was destroyed, uh, because certain men tried to capitalize on it, or, uh, or tried to uh, benefit themselves by what God was doing over in that country. But anyways, back then, the Lord uh, manifested himself to me through one of his prophets. And I remember plainly that the Spirit of the Lord spoke to this man and said, Son, everything I have is, is yours. My wisdom is yours. My power is yours. My strength is yours. Anything, everything you want can be yours. I'm willing to give you everything as long as you give me what rightfully belongs to me. There's one thing that God will share with no man. What is that? His glory. He's reserved this exclusively for himself. Amen? And let me tell you something, brother, and as long as you give God the glory that is due to his holy and eternal name, you can have anything and everything that God has provided for his people. Huh? 
the anointing will be, can be manifested in, in your life as long as you live on the face of the earth. You'll have wisdom. You'll have power. You'll have grace. You'll have anything, everything can be yours as long as you give God the glory that is due to his name. But when you begin to seek your own glory, or you let permit other people to seek your glory, that's another temptation. Because you know, uh, these big names, these men that have been successful in ministry, surround themselves by people that are always flattering them. They're boosting their morale. And it, this is a dangerous thing because some of those that write up the magazines and write up the brochures, uh, they, they begin to, I don't know if this is the right word in English, adulate. Perhaps you've never heard that word before. I haven't either. <laughs> I'm just transliterating from Spanish. <laughs> Actually. But they begin to talk about these men as something, as, as, as if they were supermen. Well, I told a young man recently, I said, there's no great men. Huh? There's no great men. <laughs> there's certain men that have discovered that they have a great God. Huh? But there's no great men. All of I told our young people in our Bible school, I said, all of God's men have feet of clay. Now they disguise it. They cover it up with the shoes. But you just get down and take their shoes off and you'll find that every one, single one of these men has feet of clay. And you know what happened to that image uh, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Uh, all the gold and the silver and the brass. But when that stone that had, was, had not been hewed or had not been cut with human hands, when that stone rolled in struck the image in those, that, those, that clay feet, what happened to the image? It disintegrated. It just broke. It went to pieces. Uh, the, that poor image uh, suffered the same fate as Humpty Dumpty. Uh, and let me tell you, brethren, when God gets finished with some of these ministries, they're going to be, they'll be Humpty Dumpty. There won't be any left up to pick up and put back together. Amen? Why? Because God is zealous of his glory. Jesus constantly emphasized the fact that he had not come to seek his own glory, but had come to seek the glory of him that sent him. Amen? John 8, 50. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh in judgment. He said, I'm not seeking my own glory. I'm going to let the Father glorify me. Uh, God in his own time, in his own way, he's going to exalt me. He's going to glorify me. I'm not going to seek my own glory. Uh, because he had been sent to seek the glory of the Father. Okay? Let's continue to look for another, several more verses. In John 5, 41. John 5, 41. I receive not honor or glory from men. Jesus rejected every effort put forth by men to exalt him or honor him and glorify him. Uh, you remember when Nicodemus came to him and said, uh, Master, uh, you want to tickle his ear. He said, Rabbi, uh, we know of a certainty that you've been sent of God. Because no man can do the works that you do unless God was with him. Or Jesus answered that, oh, Nicodemus, that's so nice of you. Huh? Uh, it, it sounds so good coming from a man that's so highly respected amongst the Jewish people. I've been just waiting for this. Did he lap it up? What did Jesus do? He ignored it. He went right to the heart of the matter. He said, Nicodemus, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man is not born again, he cannot see, much less enter into the kingdom of God. Amen? But, oh, brethren, we, we just love to hear people say nice things about us. Many times in my ministry, after I preached a sermon, and a sermon that I thought had just come across great, I head for the door and wait to shake people's hands, and I want, I'm just listening for some comments that, that will make me realize that I just preached a masterly sermon. Hmm? And the devil, he, he, he's sly. He'll send some little old bitty, come up and say, oh, Brother Perry, that was a great sermon. I've never heard, heard, heard a sermon like that in all my life. Uh, and this will puff you up. But pride cometh before the fall. Amen. Let's be careful, brethren. Because we are not supposed to seek our own glory, neither we are supposed to permit other men to seek our glory. Uh, I, I praise God that I never developed what we would call a great ministry. A ministry on what you would consider on international scale. Um, most people don't even know who Norman Parish is. As long as God knows, who cares? Uh, but let me tell you something. The reason why God can't entrust us with one of those ministries is because it would turn our heads. 
Huh? God would be contributing to our downfall. Because we, as human beings, cannot extend that kind of praise and adulation. We can't. And so the Lord tucks us away in some hidden corner of the world. Huh? And we're ignored. And perhaps even despised. And we, whatever we do never gets out. Nobody ever discovers what we have done. Huh? And, and I, I've been very hesitant, as you can see in these meetings, to even share with you what God has done in Guatemala, what God has done in Central America. I haven't even given you a report. Because one of the hardest things that a missionary has to do is go from church to church kind of informing the people of his own ministry. I hate that. Or years ago I said, Lord, I don't want to do that. I want to go and bless God's people. So I, when I travel, I go and preach. And I go and minister. And just in passing, I might say something about the work in Latin America. And that su suffice. Because when people get blessed, they get behind you. Huh? When they get taught, they get behind you. And uh, I haven't had to go around shooting my own horn. I just let the work speak for itself. Now, I've told people, I said, some people say, I'd like to come down and say your work, see your work. I said, well, if you're, you've got six months or more uh, to spare, come down and travel with me from country to country, area to area. It would take that long to see the extent of the work. That and more. Huh? But brethren, let's be careful. I, I believe God wants to use us in great and marvelous ways. Don't you think so? People that have entered into deliverance, entered into sonship, entered into kingdom teaching are the people that God wants to use the most. But he's never going to be able to use us until we determine that we will never rob him of his glory. Amen? And when people begin to applaud us, and when people begin to exalt us, we're going to have to do what Jesus did. Ignore it. Reject it. Amen? Remember when the Greeks came to seek Jesus? We would see Jesus. What did Jesus do? Did he come out and chat with them? Huh? They want to take him, probably they want to extend an invitation so he'd go, go to Athens, yeah. to Greece, to speak before the great thinkers of his day. Uh, that was a juicy offer. But do you know something? Jesus didn't even come out to greet them. Uh, he was kind of uncouth at times, wasn't he? Snobbish at times. And brother, that's what's going to take. Uh, because if we begin to accept man's glory, we're in serious, serious trouble. Amen? Okay. Let's for, go to First Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 6. Not only Jesus, but Paul knew what this meant. Because here in First Thessalonians 2, 6, it says, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others. Uh, Paul says, we didn't seek anyone's glory. We didn't seek your glory. We didn't seek the glory that other men were willing to dispense. Brethren, if we want to become men and women as Jesus, as Paul, we're going to have to say have the same attitude. Now, let's look at some verses in Scripture where Jesus was instrumental in bringing glory to the Father. Matthew chapter 15, verse 31. Matthew 13, 15, 31. Well, we can read 30 and 31. It says, And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see. And they glorified whom? Did they glorify Jesus? They glorified whom? The God of Israel. See, every miracle we perform in the name of Jesus Christ should bring glory to God. Every deliverance case, every healing case, and every manifestation of God's power in us and through us should be the means that God uses to bring glory to his own name. Amen? Amen? That's very important, brethren, because our sermons shouldn't bring glory to us. Our miracles shouldn't bring glory, bring glory to us. Everything should be directed towards the Father. Amen? You still want to see some more scriptural evidence? Okay, let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 2, verse, tw uh, verse 12. Here we see the healing of a man that was uh, uh, brought on a stretcher. man that had the palsy, a man that had been paralyzed either from the shoulders down or the hips down. And after Jesus raised him and Jesus healed him, verse 12 says, And immediately he arose, took up the bed and went forth before all, insomuch that they were all amazed and what? Glorified God. See? Let's be very careful. Because our, our deeds, our efforts, should be used to glorify our Father which is in heaven. Luke 7, 16. Luke 7, 16. Here we read about the, the 
resurrection of the son of, of a widow, a widow from the city of Nain. Remember, this widow had only one son. He was her uh, mainstay. Uh, he was her only hope for uh, her advanced years in life. And suddenly this boy passed away, and they were taking him out of town to bury him when Jesus interrupted uh, that uh, funeral procession. And he walked up, spoke to the boy, injected life, and the boy rose and walked. And what does it say here? In uh, verse 16, And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. Amen? Who received honor? Who received glory? God. See? By the healing of the sick, by the restoration of the, of the main, by the re resurrection of the dead. Every case, every miraculous case in Jesus' life brought glory to the Father. Let's continue to read in Luke 13, 13. Here we have the case of a woman that was highly demonized, the woman with the spirit of infirmity. Jesus found her in the synagogue. And after setting her free, he restored her. Uh, he, 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 he not only healed her disease, her deformity, but this woman was able to walk out of that uh, synagogue standing tall. And here in verse 13 it says, And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she was made straight, and what? And glorified God. Can, let's continue to read here in Luke 17, 15. Luke 17, 15. It's talking here about those lepers, those ten lepers I made a uh, reference to this afternoon. And it says in verse 15, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Uh, Luke 18, 43. Talking about blind Bartimaeus. And immediately he received the sight and followed him glorifying God. So, brethren, we can see here that in every case of deliverance, every case of healing, every case of restoration to life, who was glorified? God. And, brethren, that should be our goal in life, that every, by every word and deed, that we will bring glory to the Father. How many have read John 15, where it talks about bearing fruit? Uh, when we bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit. What does it say? Uh, let's read there in John chapter 15, verse 8. John... 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. When we bear much fruit, it won't be the vine that will receive the glory. It will be the husbandman that will receive the glory. Amen? When you see a, an orchard with some apple trees or pear trees or plum trees and they're just loaded down with fruit, uh, you won't glorify the dirt. And say how fertile, or you won't grow, glorify the the tree, and say how uh, how would you say the word in, in English? How fruitful? Who will you glorify? The husbandman. You, you, you'll say that man really has. He knows how to take care of those, of those trees, to prune them and to fertilize them, so that they'll bear an abundant crop. And that's what God wants us to do. That through our life, He might be glorified. The fruit that it's talking about here is, I think, other souls. You know, a, pr a, a pear tree will produce what? Pears. An apple tree will produce apples. And if you're born again Christian, what are you going to produce? Christian. Huh? Uh, we heard Brother Ben Sweat talking about tonight about the joy, the, the pleasure of winning souls for Christ. And really, brethren, that's the goal we should set uh, for the next year, is that we are going to be instrumental to bring other people into the fold. Huh? That through our life and our testimony... Others will be attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the kind of fruit that God is seeking for. This is the kind of fruit that will bring glory to God. Not all our talking. It's not all our shouting. It's not all our dancing. The thing that will glorify God the most is when we begin to bear fruit and fruit that will remain unto eternal life. Amen? How many can praise the Lord tonight? Okay, there's many, many, many other verses that we could use. Let's just look at a couple. Philippians 1.11 Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Amen? And then 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 6.20. It says, For we are, ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. And one of our purposes in life to be to glorify God with everything we have. Our physical abilities, our spiritual abilities, everything that was in it, within us should be used to glorify God. 
that when people see us, when they come in contact with us, when they receive ministry from us, they won't speak well of us, they'll speak well of whom? Of our Father and of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've seen two things that we have been sent to do. First, we've been sent to do God's will. Secondly, we have been sent to seek God's glory. Third, we have been sent to preach God's word. Amen? Let's look at now in John chapter 3, verse 34. John 3, 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. Amen? For he whom God hath sent speaketh the word of God, which is one of the signs of a man that has been commissioned of God or sent of God, that he won't get up and talk a lot of little stories that might be very interesting, but not very substantial. You know, there's a lot of preachers in the pulpits of America that get up and read book reviews. They get up and talk about anthropology. And they get up and talk about psychology. Uh, they get up and give some nice platitudes. They spend 20, 30 minutes talking about world events. A man that has been truly sent of God does what? Speaketh the word of him that sent him. He preaches the word. In season and out of peace. He's bold in proclaiming the word of God. He studies it and expounds it because he knows that this word is, 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 this word bringeth light. My words are spirit and are what? Life. Now they want to minister life to the congregation and they can only minister life as they are preaching the word of God. Let's look at another verse. How many can praise the Lord tonight? I can see some of you are mighty weary. That's too bad. You'll have to bear with me just a little while longer tonight. John 14, 24. John 14, 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Jesus didn't get up and speculate. Jesus didn't get up and brag about his knowledge. What did Jesus do every time he stood before a small or large group? Huh? Preach the word. And he preached the word with such authority that the people were astounded. They said that he speak with authority and not like the scribes. The scribes had taken their messages out of books and out of magazines. I've had preachers come to Guatemala and they've asked me to interpret for them and we've had uh, some large meetings and they've, they've got a, what do you call this? Uh, no, uh, uh, the thing you gave me, one of these uh, notebooks, uh, a loose leaf notebook and they got sermons that have been photocopied out of some of the magazines of some of the preachers of America. They preach Kenneth Hagin sermons. They preach Oral Roberts sermons. They preach Tommy Osborne sermons. Uh, verbatim. They get up and preach them. So there's a curse placed upon that in the Bible. Do you know that? And I don't have the exact verse right now. I, I would have looked for it if I uh, had, had uh, thought that I was going to say this. But it says, Cursed is the man that steals his words from another. Or that he steals his message from another prophet. And we've got to get a word directly from God. Amen. The message we preach should be a message that God has given us. I'm not a great preacher. I never pretend to be a great preacher. But let me tell you something. Every message I've preached here or anywhere else in America is a message that I've received directly from God. You can be sure of that. I, I have an awful time organizing my material, outlining my material, illustrating my material. I don't have a lot of time to really prepare some brilliant pieces of oratory. But let me tell you something. Every me message I preach has been original. Amen? And so if the message is bad, blame it on me. Huh? Because I haven't gone around trying to imitate some of the other preachers of America. Huh? God bless them. And I'm glad for the revelation that's come forth through their minds and their lips. But let me tell you something, brethren. If you want to be a, a person that God will use mightily, somehow, somewhere, you better get a fresh message from God. Amen? And that can only be gotten uh, as you come before the Lord with an open heart, with a humble heart. You spend some time praying, studying, waiting on God to, for God to deliver you a message that you are supposed to deliver to the people. Amen? How many can praise the Lord? Yeah. Jesus said, my message came from God. That's where his, his authority of that message resided. Because it was a message he didn't go around picking up messages here and there from other men, he preached directly the message that God had burned in his soul. Now let's look at some other verses. John 8, 
John chapter 8, verse 26, verse 28. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. See, we've got to get quiet. We've got to get low before the Lord. We've got to attune our ear to God. Uh, we live in a world of extreme agitation. We're, we're, we're so flustered. We're so busy. Now, there's so much noise around. So many demands upon us that we don't have time to get awake and get quiet before the Lord. But Jesus said, the words that I speak, I have heard them from my Father. Amen? I have heard them from my Father. And if we want revelation, fresh revelation, revelation that comes directly from the Father, we're going to have to find a place and find a time when we can listen to God. Verse 28, 828. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Amen? Verse 29, And He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. Now in the same chapter, we can go down uh, to verse 38, and we'll find some more. I speak that which I have seen with my Father. Chapter 12, Verse 49 and 50. 12, 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. See, Jesus re re reiterated several times that what he spoke, he spoke by divine commission. God had told him what to speak. God had given him the word. God had placed the word on his mind and in his mouth. And all Jesus did was transmit God's message to the world. Amen? And brethren, this is what we need to learn to do. Let's not dig up some old musty sermons. God's word for 1910 is not God's word for 1984. God's word for 1930 is not God's word for 1984. You know, um, most of our denominations, Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal, are just repeated like a broken record, messages that were given of God back decades or centuries ago. God has a rima word for today. Uh, God has something that he wants his people to hear today and to do today. Uh, I've, I've read the writings of some of the great men in the end time teaching, in the kingdom teaching, that are just stale. Okay? They were good back 10, 15, 20 years ago. But when you read them today, they don't... <laughs> They don't carry the noise. Amen? And I think one of the great problems we have as we age is we begin to live in the past and preach in the past. Amen? As we age, we don't put forth the same effort we put forth back a few years ago to seek God. Uh, we, we, we dig up all our old sermons and we kind of polish them up. Huh? And they, and we preach them over and over and over again until they're just like a piece of moldy brain. Huh? Let's be careful, brethren. Jesus had fresh revelation from the Father on a daily basis. Amen? Boy, it's getting quiet. I think I, I better wrap this up before you throw me out of here. Okay, Luke chapter 4, verse 43. There's several things when we're talking about message that we have to deal with tonight. Luke 4, 43. Jesus said these words, and he said unto them, I must. There's divine compulsion. I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. What was Jesus sent for? To preach. But preach what kind of message? What was Jesus' message to the world? The kingdom of God. And then we could go through the Gospels and point out time after time after time that Jesus brought, preached the kingdom. And as he preached the kingdom, things bring in the pop around him. Uh, the sick were healed. The, the oppressed were delivered. The dead were risen. The leper or leprous were, were cleansed. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom. Now, this message was lost down through the centuries. It hasn't been, perhaps, for too long that the message of the kingdom is beginning to resurface. Uh, when I began to preach the kingdom of God 20 years ago, people would look at me funny. I, in fact, I was accused of getting into Jehovah's te Witness teaching uh, and getting into, what's his name, Armstrong uh, teaching. You know, they had stolen that message. The only people that talked on the kingdom of God 20 years ago were... Uh, the followers of, uh, what's his name, Armstrong? Yeah. Herbert. Herbert W. Armstrong. Uh, and uh, the followers of uh, 
the Jehovah Witnesses. And when you begin to talk about the kingdom of God, people are heard right. But you know that the message of the New Testament is the kingdom of God? Jesus preached the kingdom, and Jesus commissioned his disciples to preach the kingdom. What was Paul's message? The kingdom of God. What was Peter's message? The kingdom of God. You can study all the historical books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, and you'll find that from the beginning to the end, the kingdom of God was preached. And today it seems to be a novelty. See, we have been majoring on minors. Huh? We've been majoring on minors. The message of God for the world today is the kingdom of God. Just read Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end shall come. As the end approaches, what is the message that God wants the world to hear? The kingdom of God. So, brethren, if you want to be in the mainstream of what God is doing in the end time, you better brush up on the kingdom of God. You better master this subject. Amen? Amen. And, and I'm surprised that, that they're in, in many circles today, Christian circles, even Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Christians, they frown on people that preach the kingdom. Huh? Like if this was something strange and something uh, uh, completely out of place. No, brethren. Well, I don't know about that. Are you saying that with sarcasm or are you saying that prophetically? Okay. Now let's go to another verse here, brethren, in John 7, 16 and 17. We first said that Jesus had been sent to do God's will. Secondly, he had been sent to seek God's glory. Third, he had been sent to preach God's word. John 7, verses 16 and 17. Let's read what, it, what the scriptures say. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, you, you notice that the gospel we are supposed to preach is the gospel of God, the kingdom of God. And the doctrine we are supposed to teach is the doctrine of what? The doctrine of God. He said, uh, my, the, the doctrine that I teach is not mine. I've received it from the Father. And if you are willing to God, do God's will, you will know. There will be an inward witness that what I'm teaching is God's infallible word. So we must preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and we must preach the doctrine that God has entrusted into our hands. Amen, brethren? Now let's go on again to John 3.17. John 3.17 For God sent not his word as son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might, the world through him might be saved. Note that God sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Now God's ultimate purpose is to save the human race. And I believe with all my heart that God is willing and ready and anxious to save every human being living on the face of the earth today. I wouldn't be a missionary if I didn't believe that. If I believed in all that doctrine of predestination as it's taught by our Calvinist brethren, I would quit. The people are going to get saved anyway. Why waste your time? Huh? If God has already this determined in his eternal counsels who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, why waste our time on the mission field? But see, the man's invitation is for whosoever will. Salvation is full and free. Salvation is available to every human being living on the face of the earth tonight. God is not willing that any should perish. Amen. But that all should come to repent. So God today would save every man if every man was willing to humble himself before him. Every man was willing to repent and obey and believe. God would save every single human being living on the face of the earth today. Now, how is he going to save them? Huh? How is he going to save the world? Uh, we're going to have to look in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. See? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we'll, and we'll find out what the scripture has to say for us here in verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. How is, going to, how is God going to save the world? Through preaching. Through the foolishness of preaching. And now notice this. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So we, if Jesus was sent to save the world, we have been sent to save the world. Amen? And soul winning should be our priority number one. Huh? We have been sent to seek and to save them that are lost. But what is the means that God has given trusted into us to save the world? The preaching, the foolishness of preaching. God has, has chosen that very impotent and foolish looking method. The preaching of the word. How? 
privately, publicly, by all means and methods available to us today, over the radio, over the television, in the street corners, whatever, whatever way, preaching is the means that God will use to save the world. So we should become, what? Experts when it comes to preaching. Huh? All other things are contingent upon this. Uh, God is saving the world today by the foolish and preaching. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. And then we'll have to move on to another uh, subject. Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? See? That, that God here is showing the importance of, of preaching. Because it says that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be sent. But how can they call upon someone that they have never heard of? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach except they be sent? So what God, what is God trying to do here and everywhere is to raise up thousands, millions of preachers, men and women that will go with the message of the kingdom and will proclaim it boldly. Share with the world the message of God's love and God's grace manifested towards them through Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay? We have not only been sent to do God's will, to seek God's glory, we have always been also been sent to preach God's word. Amen? Brother Ben said, well, that he couldn't teach or preach. Uh, I don't believe that. He does a good job, doesn't he? Huh? Maybe that's what God's going to thrust him into next year. Yeah. Praise God. But you know, God wants to raise up a lot of you men and a lot of you women to become publishers of his word. Amen? Yes. Uh, a goodly number should go for To what? To preach the word. To preach the word of God as it pertains to his kingdom. Amen? Yeah. To be the announcers of the kingdom of God. Of the coming king and the coming kingdom. Amen. Can you say glory to God? Okay, now let's go into the fourth point. We, Jesus was also sent to perform God's work. Not only to His will, to seek His glory, to preach His word, but to perform His works. And we're going to see that as we search through the word of God. Jesus said that there in John chapter 4 and uh, verse 30, uh, and what was it? John, John chapter 4, verse 34. When He was inter after he had interviewed the women, the woman at the well, Jesus said that his, the meat, the thing that filled him and satisfied him was what? To do the will of him that sent me and what, what else? And to finish his work, the work that had been entrusted to him. The word work is, is, uh, includes all the various works that Jesus did during his lifetime. Now let's look at several verses that talk about the works of God. John chapter 5, verse 36. Let's look for that verse quickly, quickly, quickly. John 5, verse 36. But I have a greater witness than that, than that of John. For the work which the Father has given me to finish, the same work that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent. These were Christ's credentials. Now, how did God bear witness to the fact that he had sent his Son and anointed his Son? Through the works. And let me tell you something, brethren. If there's a preacher out there in the world that is not doing God's works, what are God's works? The healing of the sick, the deliverance of the oppressed, the resurrection of the dead, the comforting of the bereaved. If, if we are not doing God's works, we have not been sent of the Father. And how many evangelists, big name evangelists, today are going around preaching just the gospel of salvation? Nothing else. There's no healing, no miracles. No cases of deliverance in their ministry. They're just preaching salvation. And you know the watered-down version of, of the gospel that they're preaching. Huh? It's a wishy-washy gospel. It's an easy believer. It. Except Christ and it's all settled for time and eternity. You've got a one-way ticket to heaven. You've bought your eternal life insurance the moment you raise your hand and sign your card, your name to the card. Now Jesus says, the works that I do, they bear witness to the fact that the Father has sent me. And you can see this all through the scriptures, brethren. Huh? How did God bear witness to the validity of the ministry of the Word of God? Let's look at Mark chapter 16. Jesus said to his disciples, These signs shall follow them that believe. And we know what those signs are. There's five signs mentioned there. Verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming 
the word with signs following. Well, how did God set a seal of approval upon the ministry of these men? With signs and wonders. He was confirming. He was bearing witness to the fact that these men had been called and sent and anointed. Let's go now to John chapter 14, verse 3. No, I'm looking in Acts. Excuse me, it's Acts 14, 3. Acts 14, 3. I'm not getting all mixed up now. Acts 14, 3. It says, Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the name of, in, in the Lord, which gave testimony or gave witness unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. How did God give testimony or give witness to the validity of these men's message? Signs and wonders. Now uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard, God also bearing them witness. There's the word witness again. Both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and with gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. How did God confirm? How did God bear witness to the truthfulness of their message? To the effectiveness of their message? How? With diverse signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And brethren, God hasn't changed his methods. Amen? God hasn't changed his methods. Because today, if we are preaching God's way, God's message in the power of the Spirit of God, the same works will follow. Amen? The same, absolutely the same works will follow. Now, let's go back to John. We'll read, read quickly these couple of verses. John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. I must work the works of him that sent me. Brethren, this should be our attitude. This should be our determination. We must work the works of him that sent me. John 10, 25. Jesus answered said, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. And then John 14, 10 through 12. These are verses I think are well, very well known by many of you. Believest, that thou, and believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth me, he doeth the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the work that I do, shall he do also. See, this comes to confirm what we said. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. The Father sent Jesus to do his work, so we are sent to do God's work. The Bible gives us the assurance here that if we believe, if we exercise our faith, if we activate our faith, if we put our faith into full operation, what's going to happen? The works that I do, ye shall do also. And what else? And even greater works ye shall do. For I go to the Father. What are the greater works? Preaching over television to a million people at a time? Five million people at a time? That's what I've read in many magazines. These are the greater works. I don't think that's true. I think the day is soon at hand when we're going to see some miracles of such astronomical proportion. We're going to see such spectacular miracles that they'll outshine any miracle that Christ performed, any miracle that Paul performed. And these miracles are going to be done through Mr. Nobody. God's going to choose people that are despised, people that are ignored. Uh, he's going to choose people that don't figure in the rostrums of the great evangelistic association. And through them, he's going to do some of the greatest miracles that have ever been performed in world history. Amen? Remember when John sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one that was to come or should we wait to expect for another? He began to doubt while he was in prison. And what did Jesus do at that very same hour? He performed some miracles. Went out and healed a few sick. He cleansed a few leper. And what did he say to these men? Go tell John what you have seen. These are my credentials. Uh, the blind see, uh, the lame walk, etc., etc. This is the proof of the pudding. And let me ask, tell you something, brethren. If you have really been sent of God and anointed of God, you are going to go out and perhaps in very quiet ways without trying to impress anybody, you're going to do the very same work that Jesus did. What does Luke 4, 18 say? This was a Christ's... Um, inaugural message. The first message he ever preached at the, at the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. What did he say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me, and what else? And sent me. He has anointed me and sent me. And then he mentioned the several different things that God had commissioned him to do. Preach the gospel to the poor, what else? Heal the brokenhearted, set the captive free, open the eyes of the blind, etc., etc. 
See, this is the ministry that God has entrusted in our hands. And let's, brethren, not settle for anything less. Amen? The deliverance message is not, has not been entrusted to a handful of men like Derek Prince or Don Basham or uh, Wynn Worley or uh, anybody else. The deliverance ministry is a ministry that's been entrusted to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And are you a member of that church? Uh, are you an active member? Well, go and do likewise. Go and heal the sick. Go and deliver the oppressed. Go and perform miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By doing that, you will give ample evidence that you have been sent in the same fashion, in the same manner that Jesus was sent. Okay, I'm going to give you a fifth point. And I know that it's not... Uh, proper according to the rules of oratory or the rules of uh, homiletics to give a five-point message or a seven-point message. It's not unusual for me to give, give a 10 and 12 and 15-point message. There's so much in Scripture. But we've seen, first of all, that Christ was sent to do God's will. In second place, to do what? To seek God's glory. In third place, to preach God's word. In fourth place, to perform God's works. And in fifth place, to impart God's blessing on the world. Amen? To impart God's blessing on the world. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. The very last verse. Acts three, twenty-six. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. God sent his son to bless. Not to curse, but to bless. Uh, not to curse, but to bless. The Bible says that God raised him up and sent him to bless you in turning everyone away from his iniquity. When do we start getting blessed of God? When we get saved. That's the initial blessing. Amen? Well, one of the things we need to know, brethren, is that if God blesses us, it's not for us to glory in that blessing, to keep it and to enjoy it and to hoard it. We have been blessed in order that we might become a blessing to the world. We should be just the conduit or we should be just the channel. The blessing of God should throw, flow through us, through, through our lips, through our hands, through every part of our being. We should bless the world as Jesus blessed the world. Amen? Uh, I remember reading back in the book, book of uh, Numbers that an old heathen king, uh, his name was Balak, stated it some words that were profoundly true. He said of Balaam, he said, I know that whosoever you bless, will be blessed. And whosoever you curse, will be cursed. Brethren, we should leave this place with the conviction that whosoever we bless in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be blessed. That God's God going to pour his blessing upon the people that we bless in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You remember there in the book of Hebrews, and I'm not going to look it up for you tonight, but when it's talking about the Melchizedek priesthood, it says that the lesser is blessed by the greater. Now, who was greater between Melchizedek and Abraham? Well, uh, in our estimation, perhaps Abraham, because he was the first patriarch. Uh, but in God's sight, who was greater? Melchizedek. Now, who was Melchizedek? I don't want to get into controversy tonight. I bet you everybody's got his opinion as to whom Melchizedek was. Some say he was the archangel Michael. Some say that he was the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you're wrong. Melchizedek was a created being. And Jesus never was a created being. Uh, Melchizedek was a spirit of the highest order, a pure spirit, like unto the Son of God. It doesn't say he was the Son of God. He said he was like unto the Son of God. Uh, and God prepared a body for him. And when that, when that body was prepared, he sent Melchizedek, who was a spirit being, to dwell within that body. That's why he was never born. He was not born as a baby. God prepared him a body, and when that body was of a mature age, God sent Melchizedek to dwell and to manifest in that body. And he became both priest and king. And when he had fulfilled his role, when he had fulfilled his divine commission, when he had fulfilled the ministry that God has addressed him, God snatched him away. Melchizedek, the spirit being, departed from that body. That's why he never died. That's why the Bible says that he had no beginning or ending of days. Amen? He was an exalted being of the highest order. It was a spirit being like unto the Son of God. That's why he was greater than Abraham. And what did Melchizedek do when Abraham bought, brought him his tithes? Huh? He blessed him who was the heir of the promises of God. And let me ask you, did that blessing become effectual? 
Huh? Well, we are sharing in that blessing today. Huh? Jesus became a curse. He took upon himself the curse. He was, he was nailed to the tree, and because of that he became a curse, so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon whom? Us, who were Gentiles. Amen? That we might enter into partake of the blessings that had been prophesied on Abraham through this, through the mediation of this man called Melchizedek. Amen? Now, brethren, God wants us to go out and bless the world. And if we become a source and a channel of blessing to the world, we will, in a certain measure, be entering into that Melchizedek priesthood. I don't have time to talk about the Melchizedek priesthood today, tonight. But really, brethren, we have been sent out into that world to bless. Huh? Has your life been a blessing? Huh? Has your conduct been a blessing? Has your testimony been a blessing? Have you blessed your family? Have you blessed those people that surround you, the people you come in contact in the bus, in the plane, in the train? Are, are you a blessing to your fellow employees? Are you a blessing to your fellow students? Rather than every day you get up during 1985, you should say, Lord, make me a blessing. Uh, make me a blessing. I want to bless people. I, I get no greater joy in life than blessing people. When I see that people get blessed through my prayers or, or get blessed through my actions, when I be able to, to bring people out of darkness into light, when I am able to bring people out of despondency into joy, I bless people. Huh? And that's what Jesus was sent into the world to do. The, the words constantly is stating the, this. It says, bless your enemies. Bless and not curse. There's so many, many verses. You can take down your concordance and go through all the word, verses that talk about being bla blessed or blessed or blessing. And you'll be surprised how much the Word of God has to say about this. But we're just going to look at one verse. 1 Peter 3.9. 1 Peter 3.9. Not rendering evil for evil. That would be revenge or vengeance. Or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Knowing that ye are there unto call that ye should inherit a blessing. First, we must inherit a blessing in order to minister a blessing. Amen? Now, how many have received a blessing during this camp, during this convention? Huh? You've been blessed through the teaching. You've been blessed through the music. You've been blessed through the ministry of the Spirit. Now, what are you going to do with that blessing? Keep it to yourself? That blessing will wither away, will die quickly if you just keep it to yourself. Huh? What are you supposed to do? Inherit a blessing in order to become a blessing. Amen. That's what the scripture is plainly teaching. And brethren, there's nothing I desire more for you during the year of 1985 is that you become a blessing to every person you come in contact with. Peter was such a blessing that even his shadow blessed Peter. Brethren, if we, if we could become such a blessing that even our breath could bless people. Huh? Our smell could bless people. The blessing of God could ooze through our, out of our pores. We could just radiate. We could just glow with the blessing of God. This is the end of Part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A of the Monday evening, uh, December the 31st, 1984, Watch Night Communion Service at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. We could just radiate. We could just glow with the blessing of God. The blessing of God could just flow out of us to others. Brother, many of us thus far have been hindrances instead of blessings. Huh? We've been stumbling blocks instead of blessings. Why? Because we've been so self-centered, just preoccupied with ourselves, worried 
about our own self, about our health, about our happiness. We've been so self-centered that we haven't been of no use to the kingdom of God. Break out of that shell. Amen? And let that new man, that recreated man, let that man that has been created in the image of Jesus Christ just begin to live his life through you. Amen? And then you'll bless and not curse. Amen? As the Father has sent me, so send I you. How many of you want to carry out that kind of a commission during 1985? Huh? Sent to do God's will. Sent to seek God's glory. Sent to preach God's word. Sent to perform God's work. Sent to impart God's blessing. There's no greater calling. Five things. Why don't you count them with the fingers of your right hand? Huh? Sent to do God's will. Sent to seek God's glory. Sent to preach God's word. Sent to perform God's work and sent to impart or to minister God's blessing to the world. As the Father sent me, so send I you. This is your personal commission. Accept it from God. And make up your mind that during 1985, you're going to do those five things. If you do them, the life of Christ will be rep reproduced in you. What does First John 4 say? And this is my last verse, I promise. There's so much more I could talk about tonight. But First John Chapter 4, and I think it's verse or verse 17. Just underline this in your, in your Bible. 1 John 4, 17. As He is, so are we in the world. As He is, so are we in the world. Well, as He is, so ought we be in the world. Sad to say we're, we're not what we're supposed to be. Huh? But we're on our way. And how beautiful it would be in 1985 that we could say, as he is, so am I in the world. What he did, what he spake, this is what I ambition to do. With a healthy ambition, with a godly ambition. I want to be Christ-like in my words, in my attitudes, in my deeds. As he is, so ought we be in the world. Let's stand. Let's pray right now. Why don't you make an act of dedication to God tonight and say, Lord... To the best of my ability, I propose tonight at the threshold of another year, just before another year is going to be ushered in, I propose to do exactly what the Word of God has said tonight. As the Father has sent, sent Jesus, so Jesus has sent us. Let's make up our minds tonight that we're going to carry out this five-fold commission, this five-fold commission to do His will, to seek His glory to preach His Word, to perform His works, and to impart His blessing to a dying world. Raise your hands and raise your voices before God. You make your own personal commitment. You make your own personal act of dedication. Don't wait for me or for anybody else to pray for you tonight. You just, you just uh, make a vow, make a promise before God that to the best of your ability, you're going to use your money, your strength, your time, you're going to use everything God has placed at your disposal to carry out this fivefold commission. No matter what your age might be, no matter what your condition might be, God can use you in unusual ways to see this fulfilled during the 365 days of 1985. Don't let the devil tell you that you're too old, or you're too feeble, or you're too ignorant, or you're too poor to do these things. God's resources are available to you. All the riches and glory in Christ Jesus are at your disposal. Take them tonight. Use them tonight. Share them tonight. Go out of this place with this commission on your mind and on your heart. As the Father sent me, so send I you. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God guide you. And may God use you during 1985. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Brother Glenn, I think the goodies are going to be served. Father, we thank you this evening for the privilege we've had of gathering together this week, of praising and magnifying you and blessing you, and you <coughs> pouring out your word in and through us, opening up our hearts to an understanding of the Lord Jesus. Father, give us a desire and a burning hunger in our hearts to serve you. We make Jesus Lord of our lives. Lord, I hope they don't get tired of hearing me say that Jesus is Lord because you are. And I declare that you're Lord. Help us all, each one here, Father, and wherever across the face of the earth, 
that men call on the name of the Lord, that they declare that Jesus is Lord. And Father, help us to be able to cause men to call on the name of the Lord, to declare that he's Lord, making him Lord of their lives. And, and, and I thank you for the privilege we have this evening, Lord. Father, we thank you for the refreshments. Help us to enjoy it, Lord, and enjoy our fellowship together. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you back here 11 o'clock, a little after, and we'll come back to praise and worship and sing unto the Lord and thank him for his goodness of this year and what's going to happen for in the name of the Lord through us next year. Then we're going to uh, have communion, and then Ben's going to come back, and we're just going to praise and worship and glorify the Lord. And then... Somewhere around, I think we ought to really get down on our knees for a few minutes. And that's not long enough. We ought to get down and thank the Lord and bless the Lord with, our, with all of our hearts and mean it as, and, and, be, and praising him as we trade one year for another. I don't know how it is in God's economy, but as we know it to now, why it's one year for another. And I believe that this next year is going to be one of the the greatest years that ever has been the manifestation of the power of God in the earth. And along with that, of course, will be the manifestation of Satan's power because he's determined to destroy those who are that God raising up or those that are determined to serve God. So we got a battle on our hands. It ain't a recreation hall. It's a battlefield, brother. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to serve communion. And I'm going to ask the gentleman... To help me, I'm going to ask, ask uh, Harlan to come back up here and help us, and and uh, Brother Thomas, <clears throat> and uh, Norman when he comes back, and I'm going to need Harold and Jim. Uh, I'm going to leave Jay stay here because he's going to help Ben pretty soon with some more praise and worship. Uh, Norman, come on and join us here. As we serve Jim, come and help serve communion, please, with Harlan and Harold. In the, the book of Matthew, I'm reading from here this evening. In uh, Matthew, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. A continuing verb is... That is a continuing without end. The body of Christ, his body, is a continuing thing for us today. It's without end, we might say. And as we partake of the bread tonight, we're partaking of the broken body of the Lord Jesus. And uh, I'm not one, as I've said before, I'm not one to have communion as a, 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 as a, uh, a tradition. I believe when we take communion, we should consider... Uh, the purpose of it, what it's for, and we should examine our hearts, that we uh, are not one of those that the Scripture tells us that, uh, that they came to an early death because they didn't rightly discern the body of Christ. And we need to consider when we take communion that we are partaking of a sacredness before the Lord, that it represents the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, who died for my sins and for your sins. His body was broken for my healing and your healing. It's not something that we take lightly or do lightly. It's something that we do in awe and reverence before the Lord. And as we do this this evening, do it acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, and that by his broken body there is a way for our healing and salvation of our, of our bodies. That's what it amounts to, a salvation for our bodies as well, and the, the blood is for the salvation of our souls. But... Uh, Examine ourselves and pray and ask the Lord to cleanse our hearts tonight that we be worthy. For we are really are all unworthy, except because of Jesus are we worthy of this. Uh, Brother Thomas, will you pray over the bread, please? And do you have a word to say? Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity of communing with the Father through this sacrament. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship of one with another. We realize fully that Jesus told us to partake in remembrance of his work on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that there is healing in the sacrament and because of the spilled blood on the cross. 
And we thank you, Lord, that as we enter into this time of fellowship and communion, that your word tells us to put away all sin and to repent of all ungodliness. And we praise you, Lord, now as we do this in accordance with your word. Now, what I'm going to do is just pray a prayer. And if you'd like to pray that prayer after me, meaning it from the depths of your heart, we're going to ask the Lord to cleanse us from all sin so that we will be worthy of partaking of the communion. So would you stand? <coughs> Let us pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. I confess all of my sins before you. I confess all of my sins before you. All sins of thought, word, or deed. All sins of thought, word, or deed. Omission and commission. Omission and commission. Father, I repent of them. Father, I repent of them. I know that you have heard my prayer. I know that you have heard my prayer. I thank you for answering it. I thank you for answering it. And I thank you, Lord, for for forgetting my sins thank you, Lord, for forgetting my sins. and tossing them as far as the east is from west. Tossing them as far as the east is from the west. And now, Father, we thank you for the privilege. Now, Father, we thank you for the privilege for partaking of the broken body and the blood of Christ. For partaking of the broken body and the blood of Christ. And as we do this, Father. We, we thank you for the healing of our bodies and the restoration of our minds. And we praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that God has impressed us on the mission field is that this uh, act that we're partaking of tonight is not just an empty ritual. Uh, many churches, uh, they just go through the form. It's just a ceremony that they have to rush through. Uh, they do it out of habit. They do it out of uh, obligation. But they don't derive any spiritual blessing from it. I believe that Jesus meant it when he said that his, uh, his body was true meat and his blood was true drink. Uh, I don't believe in transubstantiation. Uh, but I do believe that in some very mysterious and miraculous way, God saturates uh, the bread and the wine with the redemptive merits of Jesus Christ. And I believe that when we eat this bread, we can receive healing for our bodies. And when we drink this cup, we can receive cleansing for our souls. Uh, I've seen a lot of people healed in, in, during communion. A lot of people restored during communion. And it's one of the ways that God has provided for his church for uh, so that the church can enter into the redemptive benefits of Calvary. So as you partake of the bread, don't think you're just pe eating a piece of bread, a piece of wafer. Uh, believe that truly you are partaking of the broken body of Christ. And as this, uh, you, you eat the bread in faith, you can receive from God the physical healing and strength that you need. Then as you partake of the cup, Believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing you, sanctifying you, and liberating you from many of the things that have been troubling you down through the years. So remember, this is my body. This is my blood. Believe that what God said is true. That literally, in some spiritual or in some mysterious way, but literal, you are actually partaking of Jesus Christ. Then, in Matthew 27, or 26, and verse 27, it says... And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them. And he said, Say, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now hold it. I'm going to ask Brother Parrish to pray before we go ahead and pass it, but to pray before we partake of the bread and the, and the wine. Let's all stand. <clears throat> and let's all raise both the bread and the wine before God tonight. Father, tonight, as we stand in your holy presence, we take these elements and we sanctify them and we saturate them with the redemptive merits of Jesus Christ. Let this bread truly be the broken body of Christ. 
And let this wine truly be the shed blood of Christ. That as we partake of these elements in faith, we might enter in the possess these benefits that were made available to us by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse our soul. Renew our mind. Strengthen our spirit and heal our body. Yes, take control of our entire being tonight, Lord. That we might become 100% Christians as a result of this experience that we are partaking of in the your Holy Press. Let us, Lord, tonight come to a new realization of what we have in Jesus Christ. That, Christ. that Jesus Christ is in us. That he is the hope of glory. The hope of a new life. And the resurrected and glorified life in your holy presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, let us now partake of the bread and partake of the wine. Let us partake of Jesus Christ. Let us enter into the communion of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us all to determine, Nina, come here pretty please. I want us all to make up our mind that we're going to praise the Lord all this coming year. I will praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to make up our mind. We're going to praise him. We're going to praise him and praise him. Okay? All of us. Okay. Now, we're going to sing a couple more courses, and we're going to praise the Lord. Then we're going to pray the blessing of the Lord over all as we, you travel, and the knowing of the Lord until we gather together again at another camp meeting. Never all of us together again at the same time here in this place, but I expect to see you all back from time to time as we gather together to praise and to worship the Lord, declaring that he is Lord over all that we survey. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Let's stand. Praise you, Jesus. Can't praise the Lord good right. sitting down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, the Lord, high, oh, Lord, above all the earth.
In your presence, we all know it. And just just take the one hand of the one next to you. Let's let's get this this fellowship, this immunity, and and love each other. Start this new year out loving each other. That's what it's all about. Just love each other. Hallelujah. It is better. In his presence, there is peace. In his presence, in his presence, there is joy. Let me. anointing of the Holy Ghost flow and move through thy each heart and life. Let your protection hand rest over the blood of the Lord Jesus cover. Father, we invoke your blessing on each person that has been and is still here, and we thank you, Lord, for the mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost to flow and move through each and every life. We thank you, Lord, for a touch of the power of the living God that shall stir their hearts so that we, we each one shall never be the same again for because of being here together. Father, I thank you for your presence to flow in the convicting power of the living God to rest on each one who would ever in anywhere err from thy way. Let the Spirit of the Holy Ghost flow and move upon them, convict them, draw them back unto yourselves. And Lord, let the anointing of the Holy Ghost rest over each one to be a witness testifying that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
uh, 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 declaring that he's not only Lord of their lives, but of every situation in their lives, that he's, he is also uh, uh, making them a witness before men that Jesus lives and rules and reigns in the hearts of men because he rules and reigns in our hearts. Now, Father, I thank you and I praise you for the mighty move and power of your presence that we've had together this, in this time. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. For thou art worthy, thou art worthy. Jesus is Lord and he is worthy. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord protect you and watch over you. The Lord bless you until we, until we meet again. Amen, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.